Good morning. This is Horizons Middle East and Africa. Our top stories this morning. Israel vows retaliation after Iran fired a barrage of ballistic missiles at the country overnight. Reports indicate one person has been killed in the West Bank. Oil and safe havens rally while stocks in Japan and South Korea decline as traders await clarity on Israel's response. Plus, further political turmoil. Lawmakers in Kenya begin impeachment proceedings against the deputy president. It has just gone 8 a.m. across the Emirates. I'm Jumana Bersetchi in Dubai. No shortage of headlines coming out of the Middle East region. We are going to be talking shortly about what happened exactly with those barrage of missiles fired towards Israel from Iran overnight in just a moment. Uh, but for now, let us just get a quick check on how markets have reacted to the latest de de geopolitical developments in addition to the other news that we've been paying attention to as well. The close yesterday for Wall Street was one uh, that slipped slightly into the read as news of this potential attack uh, was was being circulated and then of course it was later confirmed that Iran were, were, had sent this barrage of missiles into Israel. And on the back of that, what you saw was a knee-jerk reaction, risk-off for equities. S&P futures today leaning uh, sideways, but by the close yesterday ended up in the red. Brent also strong reaction in the energy complex. The energy up more than 5% uh, as the news came out today, up another 1.3%. Uh, and there are real concerns about what this might mean for physical supply. Up until this point, Iranian supply has remain untouched. But of course, now that things have taken just another leg uh, for the worse, then questions about what this means uh, really for Iran's oil production is weighing on the energy complex today. Gold at an all-time high. We're slipping somewhat today, just down three tenths of a percent. But broadly speaking, the theme for gold has been one of strength. Uh, this, the safe haven is up more than 35 percent this year. Uh, but as uh, geopolitical concerns again dominate some uh, of market sentiment, we're seeing more money pouring into gold once more. And then Hang Seng, the theme for China the last couple of weeks has been one of strength. Uh, Hong Kong is back from a public holiday and you can see the reaction is pretty strong and robust this morning too, up 6%. Even the property stocks uh, today also up 12% as well. So that just tells you that the stimulus effect from China continues to have a real impact on some of those Asian equity markets. As for our terminal chart today, let's also not forget the U.S. political developments. So we had the VP uh, candidate debate uh, take place just a short while while ago. Um, but into that VP debate, I thought it was interesting just to flag that according to this poll, this is the RCP poll, Trump has actually taken the lead in certain swing states. So key to consider here, RCP say uh, that Arizona's race is still a toss up with President Trump, former President Trump, leading slightly in that particular state, along with some of the other six swing states and Minnesota as well. So something to bear in mind, because this has just happened in the last week or so that Trump has taken that marginal lead in some of the swing states. And we're only five weeks away from the elections. Well, back to our top story. Israel has vowed to retaliate after Iran fired around 200 ballistic missiles at Israel on Tuesday. The Israeli army says many of the missiles were intercepted, but Iranian state media says 90 percent of them hit important strategic targets in Israel. One person has reportedly been killed in the West Bank, and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu warns that Iran will pay for its actions, while Iran's Revolutionary Guard says such attacks will continue if Israel's actions are not contained by the U.S. and Europe. Iran made a big mistake tonight, and it will pay for it. The regime in Iran does not understand our determination to defend ourselves and our determination to retaliate against our enemies. The Revolutionary Guard and Iran's armed forces are ready both defensively and offensively to repeat this operation with multiplied intensity. Let's unpack developments with Bloomberg's Paul Wallace here in Dubai. Uh, he leads Armina Economy and Government Coverage. And joining me from Jerusalem is Bloomberg's Dan Williams. Dan, uh, I'm going to start with you. Uh, just walk us through exactly what happened last night and how much damage was sustained. Well, it was an especially dramatic day and a very dramatic year. It began with a small-scale Israeli invasion of southern Lebanon and ended with this major Iranian missile salvo against Israel. Now, this was telegraphed well in advance. The United States issued a warning that it had indications the Iranians were preparing a ballistic missile launch. The Israelis didn't immediately confirm this, but they did issue 
a nationwide alert on citizens to remain closer to bomb shelters to avoid congregating in public. And then toward evening, with a few minutes warning, we had about half an hour, 40 minutes, of um, a number of waves of these missiles coming in and being intercepted uh, mostly in the skies over Israel. Some appear to have come through, especially in the desert areas of southern Israel. And I, in the Jerusalem area, had heard something in the order of 25 explosions overhead, um, suggestive of interceptions going on right there. It's worth remembering that Israel's air defense system includes an upper layer called Arrow, that uh, is designed to intercept incoming threats above atmosphere. So um, really, those would, those would have been very, very high altitude interceptions. And the Israelis put out a nationwide alert, not just because of the incoming missiles, but because of the risk of debris being spread far and wide, potentially lethal debris. We're talking about large, heavy, mm. hot chunks of metal. Um, and uh, it was over within about 40 minutes, but it was definitely an unusual, almost unprecedented event. There was something similar on April 14th, but this one felt more intense, more sustained, and on a greater scale. Mm. Mm, I'm, I'm not a weapons expert, but from what I've been reading, uh, it seems as though the type of missiles that were used uh, were a lot more potent. They were using ballistic missiles, not slow-moving missiles and drones. Dan, uh, we had some comments from the Israeli Prime Minister yesterday uh, saying, and this is a quote, Iran made a big mistake tonight and it will pay for it. Uh, what form is the uh, Israel uh, response likely to take? Well, as you know, there wasn't an explicit threat, but one might be able to read into that statement to which you're alluding. First of all, the prime minister threatened the Iranian regime specifically. Then he invoked the killing by Israel of Hezbollah and Hamas leaders in recent weeks. And perhaps Intentionally, the video showed him sitting next to the director of Mossad, the Israeli overseas intelligence agency, um, whom Iran has been bl uh, blaming for the assassination on its turf in Tehran of a uh, Hamas leader, Ismail Haniya. So there may have been messaging here that members of the Iranian leadership could be in Israel's gun sites, specifically when it comes to some sort of future covert action. Again, none of this was explicit. However, Israel is really past mm. the stage now of empty rhetoric. This is a serious multi-front conflict. It's approaching its first anniversary. And I believe, given that um, statement by Israel, other Israeli leaders, uh, Israel appears would have been to committed itself to retaliation against Iran itself. Yeah, uh, similar to what we had back in April. Uh, Paul, let me turn to you. Uh, the also, uh, Dan was just referring to a multi-front conflict. And uh, yesterday, while all this went on, of course, uh, Israel had announced that it was, it was launching these targeted ground raids in Lebanon, the ground incursion begun in the southern part of the country, airstrikes continuing overnight as well. What do we know about the latest developments in Lebanon? Adjumana, you're right. This, um, the attack on uh, Israel by Iran yesterday came less than 24 hours after the start of a ground incursion into southern Lebanon. We're still not hearing much information in terms of just how many uh, Israeli troops are on the ground in Lebanon and, and how much weaponry they have there in terms of um, tanks and things. It does seem that so far the clashes have been fairly light. Um, there haven't been reports of um, big casualties um, on um, either among um, Israeli troops or among Hezbollah or, or Lebanese civilians so far. So it's a bit unclear exactly what is happening there, but it does seem like there are um, certainly uh, troops mm. on, uh, on the ground. They're trying to destroy what they call Hezbollah's attack infrastructure um, and uh, to continue degrading the group as they've been doing in the last uh, several weeks. Yeah. Uh, I was reading reports overnight that U.S. naval destroyers fired about a dozen interceptors during uh, the Iranian attack on Israel. So U.S aided Israel at intercepting some of the missiles that were being directed at Israel. What, what has the U.S. response been in the last 24 hours? Because on one hand, they've been pushing for de-escalation, but then, of course, uh, stepped up last night to help Israel defend its, its territory. Exactly. They did, uh, they did try and prevent Israel from sending troops into Lebanon, and I think they kind of grudgingly accepted um, 
accepted it when it happened, um, hoping that Israel won't go very deep at all and that it will be quite a limited um, incursion. Yes, as you mentioned, some uh, U.S. warships were involved in the interceptions. Differently from April, um, I think Israel and the U.S. and uh, and their allies were given much less time to prepare for this attack um, because it wasn't quite as choreographed by um, Iran. And as you mentioned, it used just ballistic missiles this, this time, which arrived much more quickly than things like um, drones. Yes. So it didn't seem to be the mass scale operation that we saw last time, which saw the Jordanian, French uh, and U.K. air forces also involved. Yeah. Paul. Thank you. Uh, definitely a very extraordinary time in the region. We will keep an eye on the developments uh, as things progress and as the day progresses. Bloomberg's Dan Williams in Jerusalem and Paul Wallace in Dubai. Thank you. Now, sticking to the region, Israel has been downgraded by S&P Global Ratings for a second time this year, stating an increasing likelihood that the conflict with Hezbollah intensifies and poses security risks for the nation. The agency cut the sovereign rating to A from A+, and kept the outlook negative. It comes just days after Moody's lowered Israel's credit score on Friday, again for the second time this year. And Democrat Tim Waltz and Republican J.D. Vance opened up their vice presidential candidate debates, uh, sparring over which party is best positioned to handle the crisis in the Middle East. Vance went on the offensive, claiming the world had been more secure during Donald Trump's term as president. Meanwhile, Waltz reiterated the Democratic Party's position that Israel has the right to defend itself. Diplomacy is not a dirty word, but I think that's something that Governor Waltz just said is quite extraordinary. You yourself just said Iran is as close to a nuclear weapon today as they have ever been. And Governor Waltz, you blame Donald Trump. Who has been the vice president for the last three and a half years? And the answer is your running mate, not mine. Donald Trump consistently made the world more secure. Israel's ability to be able to defend itself is absolutely fundamental. Getting its uh, hostages back, fundamental and ending the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. But the expansion of Israel and its proxies is an absolute <clears throat> fundamental uh, necessity for the United States to have the steady leadership there. You saw it experienced today, where along with our uh, Israeli partners and our coalition, able to stop the incoming uh, attack. But what's fundamental here is <clears throat> that steady leadership is gonna matter. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Vonnie Quinn, who joins us from New York. Uh, Vonnie, interesting to see that the debate kicked off, obviously, with the, the latest developments coming out of the Middle East. What do we learn about the respective candidates' positions uh, on foreign policy and specifically the developments in the region over here? Yes, it was actually the very first question, Jimana, which I think reflects the events of the day because voters are not voting on foreign policy this time around. Many young voters, even those who are very vociferous when it comes to their support for Israel or for Palestinians, for example, also say that they're not voting on foreign policy. Typically, voters vote on pocketbook issues. But it was the first question out of the gate. And both candidates did actually say that they support Israel's right to defend itself they both, however, didn't directly answer the question, which was, if you were the final voice in the room that a future president was listening to, would you support or oppose a preemptive strike by Israel against Iran? And you basically heard the answers there. You heard J.D. Vance say that Trump basically was a deterrent himself by being such an intimidating figure on the international stage. He actually said Donald Trump delivered stability. And he asked the question, why did Iran, Hamas and their proxies attack Israel? It was during Kamala Harris time with the Biden administration, and that was a, a critique leveled at Waltz several times, not just on foreign policy, but on lots of other issues that Kamala Harris is in the current administration, and it was during this time that many of the things that voters don't like happened. For his part, Waltz used the word dangerous several times about Donald Trump and also the word fickle. He was intimating or really saying that Donald Trump would not be a good leader on the world stage for the United States or for the world. Mm. Mm. Vani, I saw a, a, a snapshot, a very quick poll that was taken right after the, uh, the debate finished, um, showing that Vance was leading marginally amongst the viewers that were surveyed in that poll. This was a CBS poll that came out right afterwards. How likely is it that a VP debate is going to move the needle on the presidential elections themselves? 
Well, you never know what actually moves the needle, right, Yamana? And that poll you're talking about was conducted by the organisation that actually conducted the debate, and it essentially mirrors what's going on in the country. 42% of those debate watchers said that Vance won, 41% said Waltz won, and the rest, another 17%, found it to be a tie. So there's essentially absolutely no winner, right, when you account for the margin of error. And this is what we're seeing. And bear in mind, states have already started voting. Up to 20 states have early voting. So for the next few days, Days, we'll see Vice President Harris, for example, in some of the states impacted by Hurricane Helene, Georgia, North Carolina, a couple of swing states. And later in the week, she'll campaign in other swing states, critical Rust Belt states, Wisconsin and Michigan. And you'll see Donald Trump and his running mate doing the same thing because it's these seven states that are going to decide the race. And so if anything can move the needle, well, it's welcome. And if a vice presidential debate in which there were no huge gaffes or no huge problems uh, were to move the needle in, you know, even in the tiniest way, then it would be very welcome to the candidates at the top of the ticket. Yeah, and at the top of the show, we were just putting up a chart showing that just in the past few weeks, uh, Trump seems to have gained somewhat of a lead in those key swing states. There's still time, of course, another five weeks to go. But interesting to note that a lot may happen between now and then still. Bloomberg's Zwani Quinn, great to have you on our show. Thank you. Now, still ahead, uh, Iran's attack on Israel injects volatility into the financial markets. Anita Krishna Gupta from Emirates NBD joins us with her insight next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Iran's missile attack on Israel brought back a war risk premium to financial markets, testing widely held bearish views on oil prices. U.S. 10-year yields swung lower on the attack, while U.S. equities sold off on fears of a widening Middle East conflict. Let's bring in Anita Krishna Gupta, head of equity strategy at Emirates NBD. Uh, I've got to say, for a while, I was surprised at how complacent the market was about the rising geopolitical risks in the region. And I think maybe it's because we're living and breathing and being in the region, very in tune with what was going on here. But it felt for a while that global markets were paying no attention whatsoever and then, of course, yesterday happened. Do you think the reaction was warranted when you look at what happened to yields, gold, oil, and even um, stock markets, U.S. Stock, mar stock markets by the close yesterday? Uh, good morning, Jumana. It's not such a black and white day as we both are. Uh, what we have is we have had the uh, apparent tension of geopolitical risk the whole year. But yesterday, it escalated for sure. So we saw a small sell-off in the U.S. markets. We're still up 21% for the year. We have had a stellar rise of most global indices. Most of them are at record highs, whether it's the U.S., Europe, India. We saw oil prices tick up yesterday. We saw uh, the U.S. dollar stronger. Now, when we're looking at markets, I think that uh, we have had such a strong performance that if markets give back a little bit, it's not to worry about. What we are looking at is inflation. Inflation, whether it is driven by higher oil prices, by supply chains that get disrupted by the increasing geopolitical tension. Um, we're also looking at the stronger dollar, as I said. Mm -hmm. So this morning, Hong Kong markets are surprisingly up 4 to 5 percent. So it looks like... Uh, Asia is not as affected by what's happening geopolitically. We yeah. are aware of closed airspace. And that, again, as I said, adds to inflation when you have longer routes for supply of uh, goods. It seems to me that there are three global major themes playing out here. You've got China fiscal stimulus and the impact that that's having across Asian markets. You've got geopolitical tension in this part of the world. And then you've got the U.S., which seems to be reacting to the Fed's beginning of its easing cycle. But at the same time, stock markets keep going for strength to strength. And those stories seem to be quite disparate. They're three almost not linked themes getting played out. Absolutely, Jamana. And starting off with China and the 10 trillion yuan uh, impetus that we are seeing that could add 1% to China's GDP. And that's positive for the whole world. So it's not just the China market going up, which was the worst performing to the best performing uh, year to date. So that's been a surprising move. Um, we've got, secondly, as you know, you rightly said, it's what's happening with the central banks. So you've got the central bank starting an easing cycle, but you've got inflation, which had been taking down both in the US and Europe. You had better, you know, PCE inflation numbers 
numbers, the last numbers which were about 2.2% for headline, which was lower than the previous month. Mm. So you had everything going in the right direction. For the ECB too, you had lower inflation in Europe. But now with higher possibly oil prices, higher mm. uh, uh, you know, inflation coming in, is that going to be a worry for central banks? You've still got growth in uh, yeah. uh, as worry and the U.S. elections. So how do you, how do you hedge for that? Are, are you looking for cheap hedges around to position for any one of those risks that you articulate. It could be higher inflation surprise and inflation shock. It could be a massive flaring up of geopolitical risks. It could be uh, at, you know, disappointment in U.S. states and actually a hard landing scenario materializing. W where do you invest to hedge for that, those situations? Uh, we would actually continue following our asset allocation model and looking at the moderate profile that's about 40% uh, equities and the rest is fixed income, cash, gold and real estate and alternatives. So we were slightly underweight uh, equities. We did that in our asset allocation meeting last month. Mm -hmm. So we thought we would kind of, you know, book in some of those profits, some of that higher run that we have seen. So at this point, we would definitely be a little bit defensive. Um, within the equity space, again, we would be defensive, so that's a double defensive. We would stay with the knitting, we would stay with the asset allocation. Definitely time to be invested still both in the U.S. and emerging markets. That includes China because both are independent in terms of performance. Uh, again, we would look at, you know, we have looked at the defense sector recently. We still think that AI has a theme to play through. Uh, you're going to see volatility in the market, but it doesn't yeah. mean that you are not invested. I would still say stay invested, ride the volatility. Yeah. but be a little bit defensive. And speaking of volatility, how are you thinking about the upcoming presidential elections in the U.S.? Markets are pricing about a 2.4% move uh, on the day. So mm -hmm. that's been an you know, average of what's happened uh, recently. But I think there's still a month to elections. And let's see what the economic agenda comes out. It's going to be a close election. There's going to be a lot of rhetoric around whoever wins. There's going to be some you know, slinging going back and forth. So I think that we will build up into this in the next one month. And let's see where markets are in the next month. Yeah, probably higher if uh, history is a guide. <laughs> Anita, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Anita, Krishna Gupta, Head of Equity Strategy at Emirates NBD. Thank you. Well, also uh, coming up, we are going to be continuing the conversation around the latest developments in the Middle East as Israel vows retaliation against Iran. We'll be speaking to Ryan Ball, Senior Media Analyst at Rain, on what the response might look like. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Horizons Middle East and Africa. I'm Jumana Bersechi in Dubai. Well, we are keeping a, cut and a close eye on the developments in the region with Iran reportedly having fired up to 200 ballistic missiles towards Israel, most of them intercepted. Uh, but the latest uh, are some uh, comments coming through from the foreign minister, Arakshi, who has uh, held separate phone calls uh, seemingly with some of his European counterparts. Iran tells UK, France, Germany to avoid engaging in conflict. So those are the latest lines coming through. And of course, we do know that the US helped Israel intercept some of the missiles that were fired yesterday. So these are worded comments towards European counterparts. Coming up, we're going to talk about Adnoc. We'll be back. This is Horizons Middle East and Africa. Our top stories this morning. Israel vows retaliation after Iran fired a barrage of ballistic missiles at the country overnight. Reports indicate one person has been killed in the West Bank. Oil and safe havens rally while stocks in Japan and South Korea decline as traders await clarity on Israel's response. Plus, further political turmoil. Lawmakers in Kenya begin impeachment proceedings against the deputy president. It has just gone 8.30 a.m. across the Emirates. I'm Shimana Persachi in Dubai. We are tracking how the latest developments in the region are affecting global markets. So yesterday, we saw somewhat of a dip for Wall Street. S&P ending the day marginally weaker, but we saw a lot of money pouring in to safe havens, the like of, likes of gold at close to all-time highs. This morning, slipping somewhat. We're only down about three-tenths of a percent. But yes, off those all-time highs once more, the uh, safe haven is up more than 35 percent this year. Brent also in focus, up another one5 
4% today. This after spiking 5% yesterday on reports that uh, Iran may be looking to target Israel. And then, of course, it did actually transpire a couple of hours later. So into and out of the fact. We saw a big energy spike. Hang Seng, though, uh, back from holidays. So Hong Kong is back from public holiday, picking up from where it left off last week. A lot of green on the screen. Hang Seng up 6%. And then we're taking a look at our uh, chart today, which has just been tracking how uh, Trump has been polling in some of those key swing states. And of course, we're coming on the heels of that vice presidential candidate debate. Uh, and uh, here you can see that just over the last week or so, Trump has actually taken the lead in swing states per this RCP poll. So something to bear in mind, we are five weeks away from the U.S. elections. But back to our top story. Iran has warned the UK, France and Germany to avoid engaging in the Mideast conflict. It came after Iran fired about 200 ballistic missiles against Israel on Tuesday, spurring swift promises of retaliation from the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. It was the second direct attack this year from Iran against Israel, raising risks of a further escalation between the two countries. The attack was a long-expected retaliation for the killing of senior figures in Iran's proxy militant groups, including the assassination of Hamas's political leader Ismail Haniye in Tehran and most recently Hassan Nasrallah. Hezbollah's long-time leader. For more on this, Ryan Ball, senior Middle East and North Africa analyst at Rain, joins me now. Uh, Ryan, how do you read uh, the events that have taken place in the last 24 hours, and specifically Iran launching another direct attack at Israel? Well, certainly this is at the face value, Iran finally making do on a retaliation long threatened, as you mentioned, uh, for the, the assassination of Ishmael Haniya and then given further boost after the assassination of Hassan Nasrallah and the deaths of one of their own generals in that same assassination. Uh, but I don't think it's coincidental that it also took place right after the Israelis declared that they were beginning their ground operations in southern Lebanon. So there were multiple purposes to this attack. The first, of course, was to respond to these provocations by the Israelis on this assassination front in this covert campaign. But it's also to send a signal to the Israelis that Iran will strike their country in the course of their ground campaign in Lebanon. Back in April, when Israel responded, there were reports that the U.S. did exercise some pressure on Israel to keep the response contained. And what they did was a very, again, a very specific targeted strike uh, on an air launcher um, a facility very close to Iran's nuclear facilities. If you remember back in April, there was concern that they had actually struck at some of the nuclear targets. They didn't in that case. How, how is the response likely to differ this time around, given the missiles that were sent from Iran were a lot more potent this time? Certainly. This was a larger strike, and, and as a result of it being the second strike, the Israelis do have to up the ante to try to signal to the Iranians that this is also dangerous territory for them. Now, that being said, I expect that the Biden administration will be putting enormous pressure on the Israelis not to listen to their hawks, including their former prime minister, Naftali Bennett, who's arguing very publicly for Israel to use this opportunity to strike Iran's nuclear sites directly. So I think the Israelis will uh, expand their retaliation to more targets within Iran. And I don't think we can totally rule out that they go more hawkish, that they ignore the Americans. They've been doing that a lot lately, and the U.S. has not been using their leverage to stop them. So there is a, there is a non-zero chance. It's, it's your less chance, but there's a non-zero chance that they do something truly escalatory, like strike Iran's nuclear sites or destroying energy infrastructure inside of Iran that precipitates an Iranian mm. response against mm. energy infrastructure throughout the region. Yeah. Ryan, from Iran's perspective, was this just not a demonstration of uh, they, they want to show internally that they, of course, are responding to the killing of, of some of these uh, senior leaders within uh, the axis of resistance? Uh, but at the same time, they must have known that most of these missiles were going to be intercepted. And therefore, could you not say that it was almost a symbolic response to show that they did something because they had promised a retaliation, but equally not going so far as to provoke perhaps the possibility of something even more uh, dangerous for the region? Well, I think there's two very different things that took place between this attack and the one in April. The first is that it wasn't telegraphed. It came very suddenly 
uh, our time this morning here in the United States, and then a few hours later it, it began. There were no drones, which are a lot easier to shoot down for the uh, the Americans and the Israelis. These were all fast-moving ballistic missiles. The Iranians claimed that they weren't their best missiles, but they were top-line missiles designed to reach Israel very quickly, and they were concentrated around military sites, airports, that the Iranians claimed were part of these assassination missions against say, Hassan Nasrallah. And so they concentrated their barrage more than they did in the previous barrage in April. But it's still a gradient of, of the way mm. that they've been concentrating this and the way they've been calculating this. This wasn't full tilt. This wasn't a full-scale attack that was guaranteed to cause casualties and destroy uh, significant Israeli military infrastructure. But it was certainly a step in that direction, much larger than it was back in April. Mm. Mm. Ryan, in your notes, uh, you have talked about Israel having a 1967 moment underway. What do you mean by that? Well, certainly that was before the events of today, but I think the Israelis, after the assassination of Nasrallah, the pager attack on Hezbollah, the assassinations of Hania, all of these are, are reframing the strategic dynamics in the region in Israel's favor. And Iran is trying to arrest that moment by carrying out this barrage against the Israelis to say that they are not giving up, that they are going to continue to support their allies uh, and their proxies throughout the region. And the Israelis are trying to build on their initiative and their momentum, particularly in Lebanon, to see if they can really push Hezbollah back from the border and potentially diminish them as, an, as a foe uh, long term. But now the Israelis are having to deal with a much larger, more sophisticated adversary in Iran. And that kind of opens up that question of, is this 1967? Is this 2006, where Israel gets bogged down? I don't think we have a, a clear answer to that, but I know that the Israelis are certainly trying to capitalize on their momentum by being as hawkish and as aggressive as they can be. Yeah. Well, let's talk about one of their other adversaries in the region, and that is Hezbollah. Uh, yesterday, the language that IDF used to describe the ground incursion was limited, targeted, uh, very specific strikes, uh, giving the impression that uh, Israel was not looking to, uh, to, to, to uh, start a protracted um, war or conflict in Lebanon or indeed across all parts of Lebanon. How do you read what is happening in Lebanon? And is it likely that uh, Israel will actually fulfill their stated war objective of managing to restore security in the north, but to do it in a short time frame? Yeah, well, in a short time frame is probably impossible. Hezbollah is going to resist this military pressure with everything that it's got, in spite of its disruptions from the, the pager attack and the assassinations. Hezbollah has a built-in resilience that means that this is going to be an extended campaign. And Israel is trying to approach South Lebanon cautiously by taking deliberate phased up steps towards a larger and larger ground incursion, and then we'll use the word invasion, in which we're seeing tens of thousands of Israeli troops cross the border. They don't want to do that from the get-go, because that's exactly what Hezbollah has been preparing for for almost 20 years. So instead, they want to try to wear down mm. Hezbollah, destroy their infrastructure, protect their own forces, and preserve their military, uh, their military and civilian morale. Israel's been at war for a full year now, or almost a full year, and that's wearing on its economy and on its public, the last thing this Israeli government can do is gamble on a mass invasion of southern Lebanon that isn't guaranteed anything but complete success. Mm. Uh, so many uh, still open questions, uh, but great to have you on the show with us. Uh, Ryan Bull, Senior Middle East and North Africa Analyst at Rain. Thank you. We appreciate your insight. Now, Adnoc has reached a deal to acquire German chemical producer Covestro for about 11.7 billion euros in what's set to be the biggest Middle Eastern acquisition of a European firm. Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta spoke to Khalid Salmin, the head of Adnoc's downstream division. He says the acquisition is a part of Adnoc's overall international growth strategy. Well, clearly, uh, it's a part of our overall international growth strategy. Uh, chemicals is a key pillar. We believe in the growth in chemicals over the long term. And for us, uh, Covestro is a very solid company that has a lot of great fundamentals. They've invented the chemistry back in the 1930s. Uh, they have great innovations. They have over 8,000 patents. I mean, this company has a, a global footprint. And as such, as we got to know the company and build a relationship with the management, we really believe that this is a company that is uh, one world class, global, 
has the right fundamentals, and hence we were able to come to this decision. You mentioned the international strategy and the expansion from Adnox's perspective. Before we dive into the details of that, I want to ask you a question that I think sparked in a lot of people's mind when they saw this deal cross the finish line, which is, why did the German government agree to this? And I ask this in the context of the fact that we have another major German deal that's seeing a lot of pushback from the government in the financial sector. Of course, Unicredit's credit uh, stake in, in Commerce Bank. Why do you think the German government said yes to this deal? Well, for us, this is a clearly a step change, transformative deal. It's a large deal. Uh, I think it's too early to say that all the approvals have been done. Today just marks a major milestone in our voluntary takeover offer. We are yet to go through the regulatory process, and that will take its own time after the voluntary takeover offer in the market. So I think we, are, uh, we have great support from all the stakeholders in Germany. We believe in that market, but at the same time, we need to understand that Covestro is a truly global company. It has significant operations out of its 48 plants in North America, in Europe, as well as in Asia. It's, it's a fascinating one and, and one that the markets are convinced will actually find all the approvals that it's seeking. Let's talk about the deal itself, though. The critics of this deal would say this was a fairly expensive one, that if you just look on a basis of a price to equity or price to earnings ratio, for example, it looks fairly, fairly costly at a time when the stake itself is something that the Covestro CEO said would be failing without further investment. How much investment is required? to hold up this company? I think uh, uh, we need to look at the chemicals as a cyclical business. So depending on which time of the market you enter, it can look differently. We always look through the cycle and not at the bottom or the top of the cycle. And that's, that's the commodities business. So from that perspective, we see there is a lot of intrinsic value. This is a growth platform for us. It is a company that has all the fundamentals, and we need to keep in mind that uh, Marcus has multiple hats, and as the head of the union and versus Covestro, he represents in the other hat over 1,200 companies. So I would really focus on the fundamentals of the business, the longevity of the business, and their ability to deliver value, which we believe is there. Well, very big deal that's gone through it was Adnox's largest acquisition ever, 12 billion euros they're paying to buy Covestro. And you can see that Covestro closed up 3.8% yesterday. Now, for a look at some of the other stories we're following, the company developing luxury tourism projects on Saudi Arabia's Red Sea coast is planning to raise at least $4 billion over the next year. Red Sea Global says the fresh financing will help roll out construction in Amala, a 29-hotel destination focused on wellness. The company says six hotels will be operational before the end of 2024, and around 20 more will open next year, including eight at Amala. The Red Sea project will target regional and international luxury travelers and is said to be key in the kingdom's plans to become a top tourism destination. Nike extended declines in late trading after withdrawing its full year guidance. The world's largest footwear company is seeking to reset expectations before incoming CEO Elliot Hill takes the reins later this month. The company reported a 10% fall in fiscal first quarter revenue to short of the average analyst estimate. But Nike's gross margin and sales in China have exceeded expectations. And Apple is said to be preparing to announce a new low-end phone, phone early next year alongside upgraded iPads. Sources say it is nearing production of an updated iPhone SE that will become its new entry-level model. Apple is also aiming to manufacture new iPad Air models and keyboards for release around the same time. And billionaire Gautam Adani's flagship firm is said to be planning to roll out its share sale as early as next week. Adani Enterprises is looking to raise over $1 billion through a so-called qualified institutional placement. The share sale marks the group's return to public equity markets after a scathing report from short seller Hindenburg Research in 2023 derailed a previous plan. Samsung is laying off workers in Southeast Asia, Australia and New Zealand as part of a plan to cut thousands of jobs worldwide. The layoffs could affect about 10% of the workforces in those markets. Shares have slid more than 20% this year as the world's largest maker of memory chips and smartphones struggles in key markets. And coming up, further political turmoil in Kenya with a move to impeach the deputy president who has accused or has been accused of corruption and money laundering. We have the details next. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to Horizons Middle East and Africa. I'm Jumana Bersechi in Dubai. In Kenya, lawmakers have started impeachment proceedings against the nation's deputy president, Rigathi Kashugawa. It is the latest sign of turmoil in President William Ruto's government, which has faced deadly protest over tax measures and rising government debt. Uh, for more on this, Bloomberg's Andiro Ganga joins us from Kigali. Uh, Andiro, so this uh, is a, a detailed motion to impeach the deputy president. Uh, on what grounds are lawmakers calling for his removal? Jumana, 11 grounds citing grounds for him, his impeachment, one in subordination of the cabinet. They're also accusing him of attacking civil servants, including a judge and the head of national intelligence, whom the two had a very public spur during the deadly Gen Z protest. And the language used in this motion, very strong, as if to signal where the party and this member stand with the deputy president. And they're saying that he uses his constitutional power solely to implement sectarian, parochial, and personal interests that seek to profit him. This bills on the corruption allegations and money laundering he's been accused of and they claim that he has amassed nearly 5.2 billion Kenya shillings worth of property ever since he came into office. This forced him to do an interview with local media. He's defending his innocence and he said, I quote, when I came into office I wasn't a poor man. He maintains he's a businessman. He's honest and he's not corrupt. But this is a little strange because just immediately they were thrown into power. A corruption charge against him was dropped, citing inconclusive evidence evidence. Mm. And for the last couple of months now, we've been talking about the economic pressures Kenya is facing, the political pressures the president has been facing with those demonstrations. How does uh, what has happened uh, and the fact that these charges are being leveled at the deputy president now play in to the st stability of this government of national unity and its planned reforms? That very national unity might be put into jeopardy. This um, impeachment motion has already begun stirring the ethnic port. Those who are supporting the deputy president and come from his community say it's a witch hunt. And we've seen in such situations politicians retrieve to tribal cocoons and whip the masses ethnically against each other. We saw this become very deadly in 2007, 2008 that left 1,200 people dead. And again, this is a fallout that the country cannot afford currently. Very fragile came off um, the protest that was against the finance bill. They withdrew the bill that was supposed to raise $2.7 billion. The budget deficit has grown by about 4.3%. And money from the IMF, $600 million, is yet to be disbursed. The country is not in a good place. Healthcare, education are deteriorating. And so the focus needs to be on service delivery. But then this motion has already been tabled, yeah. and um, they will need about two-thirds majority to vote in favor. Mm. Okay. Uh, well, something to watch out for. No doubt you will bring us that uh, vote when it does happen. Bloomberg's Ondiro Ganga, thank you so much. Welcome back to Horizons Middle East and Africa. I'm Jumana Bersechi in Dubai. Well, let's just give you a recap of the top developments that have been occurring in this region the last 24 hours because we have seen a significant escalation of conflict. Iran has warned the UK, France and Germany to avoid engaging in the Middle East conflict. It comes, of course, after Iran fired about 200 ballistic missiles against Israel on Tuesday, spurring swift promises of retaliation from Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, it was the second direct attack this year from Iran against Israel, raising risks of a further escalation between the two countries. The attack was a long-expected retaliation for the killing of senior figures in Iran's proxy militant groups, including the assassination of Hamas's political leader Ismail Hani in Tehran and most recently Hassan Nasrallah, Hezbollah's longtime leader. A, a few things just to spell out here before we get to the end of the show. Uh, many people are drawing comparisons between the first round of tit-for-tat strikes that took place between Iran and Israel back in April and what happened yesterday. There are two distinct distinctions that need to be flagged here. The first is that this time around, Iran had given less choreography. They had telegraphed less uh, that a, a strike was going to be imminent. The U.S. and Israel only had a couple of hours heads up to intercept and to get ready to intercept some of the missiles that were going to be fired. The second distinction is that this time around, Iran had fired ballistic missiles. Those are faster 
faster-moving missiles than the ones that they fired back in April. Those were slower-moving drones, easier to intercept. And so the perception is that this round of attack was a lot more potent than what we had, what we had in April. And indeed, if you listen to the language from the Israeli prime minister after the attack took place, uh, he said, Iran made a big mistake tonight and it will pay for it. The regime in Iran does not understand our determination to defend ourselves and our determination to retaliate against our enemies. So uh, the questions remain around what Israel is likely to do here and how they are likely to respond and how escalatory that response could be. And indeed, some lines have just come through from Axios saying Israel plans an Iran attack response within days. Israel plans a significant retaliation to the Iran attack. And global markets are paying attention this time around. We saw oil spike more than 5% in yesterday's trading, money pour into safe haven gold. We even saw U.S. stock markets dip into the close yesterday on concerns about these uh, rising uh, conflicts in the region and what that could mean for global markets. So keeping a close eye on that as we head into the European session. That was it for our show, Horizons Middle East and Africa. I am Shimana Versace in Dubai. Stay with us for Daybreak Europe. This is Bloomberg.